Good morning. I'm Elaine Thompson. I am the system CEO and president, and I um, really appreciate you coming today and allowing us to share with you in a very transparent way what we would like the community as well as the media to know about the current situation. Really three parts of the presentation today. The first one is I will be asking Dr. Timothy Regan, President of Lakeland Regional Health Medical Center, our Chief Medical Officer for the system, an emergency medicine physician, to come up and give you information about our first patient that tested positive with COVID-19. In addition, I will ask him to confirm to you our screening and testing protocols as of today. And I will also ask him to share with you the recommended steps you will need if you need to take care of yourself for healthcare needs during this evolving situation. Secondly, I will ask Dr. Daniel Haight, our Vice President of Community Health, Professor of Infectious Disease, University of South Florida Medical School, to come up and share with you a little bit about what we know with the disease and how important it is that the community and the healthcare systems work together so we can manage in a very safe, calm way the needs that will be upon us over the next few weeks. And then lastly, I will call upon Danielle Drummond, our CEO President-Elect of Lakeland Regional Health System. She will provide you detailed information about our system's preparation, what our current activities have been, and what some of our future planning activities are. Afterwards, I will return to the podium to facilitate a Q&A for probably about 10 minutes. As you can imagine, our time's a little limited right now with all the preparation, but our goal in this media press conference is to assure you all that you have ongoing, transparent information from our health system so we all can work together to support the community we serve. And with that, I would like to call Dr. Timothy Regan up to the podium to share with you. Again, Dr. Regan is an emergency medicine physician. He is our chief medical officer for our health system, and he also is the president of Lakeland Regional Health Medical Center. Good morning. Uh, as Elaine mentioned, I, my name is Tim Regan. I am the president of the medical center and I am chief medical officer for the health system. I'm also an emergency medicine physician and I'm proud to be a member of an amazing group of medical professionals that are here standing together to serve the community during this situation. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Lakeland Regional in general. Uh, that the, the community should continue to know and understand. I wanted to talk a little bit about our first patient. Um, and then just, I wanted to talk about some advice for the community in terms of how we can work together to manage this situation. So in general, the community should remember Lakeland Regional Medical Center is a big medical center. Our ER is the busiest in the country. We are well-trained, we are well-equipped, we are well-prepared to handle large volumes of patients in an efficient way. Given the developing situation with the COVID-19 outbreak, we have changed our paths of travel, we have changed our treatment protocols. People who come to the emergency department may find they are asked more questions, may find that they are routed to different parts of the emergency department, and then if hospitalized, will be routed to different parts of the medical center. This is all in line with CDC and state recommendations for treatment protocols and for screening procedures. Our overall goal is to make sure that the community is well taken care of, that our teams are well taken care of and are safe, and that other members of the community that are not infected are well taken care of and are safe. So we will be trying our best to limit the amount of distance patients get into the medical center while making sure that they are safely taken care of and that the staff and visitors continue to be safe. Lakeland should remember and Polk County should remember, we have an amazing medical staff here. We have 600 members of the medical staff. 
We have 5,000 team members that are all working together to make sure that this community is well taken care of during the situation. As far as our specific case, this patient was identified through our well-established screening protocols in the emergency department. The patient is an 88-year-old male that is stable at this time. The Department of Health is continuing to conduct its investigation. Out of an abundance of caution, we have asked approximately six team members to stay at home until the Department of Health has finished its investigation. And this is to protect them, to protect our patients, and to protect the community. In terms of the testing that has been done so far here at the medical center, we have sent out 68 tests. One has come back positive. We do have a number of pending tests and that number changes from day to day and hour to hour. I wanted to take some time to talk to the community a little bit about how we can help each other. In general, and Dr. Haight will talk a little bit more about the specifics of the disease, but in general, the community should remember 80% of these patients, 80% of people with the infection will have a self-limited mild upper respiratory infection consistent with what we would call a cold and would not require treatment in the medical center. For those people in the community that feel as though they need treatment, we are open for business and we are ready to take care of you. We would ask a couple of things. One, if you can call ahead, if you could call ahead to either our physician practices or to our emergency department, we have phone numbers here where people will be able to answer questions and guide routes of travel and what people should be doing. It helps our care teams immensely to know ahead of time when patients will be arriving that think they may be infected. And with that, I just wanted to take this opportunity to give a lot of thanks uh, to the team members that work here, to the amazing medical staff. You know, this is, as has been mentioned in numerous news stories, an unprecedented situation. Uh, and the city of Lakeland and Polk County should understand that you have a team of medical professionals that are committed to making sure that this community is safe. Thank you. Hate, our Vice President of Community Health, um, our um, Chief of Infectious Disease, Professor of Infectious Disease from University of South Florida, share with you a little bit about COVID-19 and very importantly about what you can do, what the community can do to keep themselves safe and help the healthcare industry handle these cases at a rate at which we would all be very proud of and we would feel very that we did it in a very safe and calm way. Together, we are really elevating the amount of education that we're constantly sharing that education and generating conversations and questions that help us stay better informed. Now, of course, the main issue that we want everyone to understand is this is a new virus, a new condition to the world, and there are more things to learn, and it is changing from day to day. Now, some of the things we do know is that there's not a vaccine for this particular infection, and that's being worked on. Treatments are being studied, and that's being worked on. And that's what we're remaining together as we go through this to understand. We do know that this particular virus, as shown here, it is a particular virus that has a covering over it that is rather delicate. That covering is used to cause the infection and stick to your insides of your nose. And we know that hand sanitizer and routine cleaning does kill this virus to prevent it from infecting other people. 
We also know if an infection occurs, 80% of individuals will have a mild condition. But your mild infection could make another person in our community sicker than you. And we are worried about the most vulnerable in our community. And we don't want an unknown infection in you to spread to someone else. So if you're mildly ill, stay home and make sure you're following hand hygiene. And if you have questions on what to do, there are the hotlines to call to get that information. We've all heard the stories of what you can do about not touching your eyes, washing your hands, but even go further, what is it that we can still continue to learn that might be important? The hand hygiene story you've heard much about, but make sure that when you're cleaning your hands, you're really getting to your fingertips, not just the palm of your hand, and not as much the back of your hand, but your thumbs, your fingertips, the hand sanitizers, as I mentioned earlier, work incredibly well, but they've got to get to the surfaces that most commonly have the germ. Get the sanitizer to the tips of your fingers and not just the palms. When you're wiping something down with a wipe towelette that does kill germs like this, make sure it's moist, that it hasn't dried out because it was the first one in the top. Go through a few of them to make sure that you get to the moist ones that has the killing materials that will rid the surface you're cleaning of this particular germ. And also very importantly, what we are all doing, and we understand how important this is, that if we do not take the precautions that are calmly being discussed right now about distancing yourself from others, staying home when you can, we will slow the spread of this infection. <clears throat> if we do not, we will see the infections increase to the point where it becomes difficult to provide the everyday care we're providing, but that's where this distancing can work, where we will continue to be able to help the community as we go through these times. And we really hope that by not congregating together, by spreading out, we will see that this will not have as a severe effect. So we do wanna make sure we understand how this can be a, a, a significant benefit to our community. With that, I'd like to turn it over back to Dr. Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Haight. And um, probably another person who you definitely want to hear from is Danielle Drummond, our CEO, President-elect. Danielle oversees all of our clinical operations over the medical center, over our physician group, and she will talk to you in specifics about our preparation activities. Good morning, everyone. As Elaine said, I would like to give you an update on some of the specific preparation activities that we've been undertaking here at Lakeland Regional Health. Dr. Regan mentioned that we are in a continuous state of readiness and preparedness to always provide excellent healthcare services to this community. However, clearly the COVID-19 situation requires us to take special consideration of what we need to do in addition to make sure that we can provide the very best care as we work together across a number of organizations here locally to make sure that everyone is taken care of. Our efforts have really been focused in two uh, categories, first looking externally and then what we're working on internally as far as preparation goes. So starting with our external efforts, we've been very closely monitoring both the global and the national occurrences and how the areas that have had a high number of COVID cases have been handling the situation and what those lessons learned are so that we can bring them back here to Lakeland and Polk County and make sure that we're applying them as we work to make sure that we're ready for whatever comes our way. A little closer to home, we continue to work across the state of Florida with other hospitals and the Florida Healthcare and Hospital Association, along with the state attorney uh, surgeon general and the secretary for the health department to make sure that we understand what resources are available to us and what other hospitals are doing so that again, we can work collaboratively across the state of Florida to be ready and know what resources we can obtain. 
In addition, we have a local hospital and healthcare system work group um, across Central Florida. Again, we're working together to understand what one another's status and capabilities and capacity are so that we can best care for any patient that has a need. And then we've worked across the Lakeland and Polk County area in particular with other healthcare providers, physician groups, and community groups to again make sure that we understand what each other's needs are and how we can partner together to be ready for everyone uh, that's coming our way for healthcare needs in response to this COVID-19 situation. Turning internally, uh, the work that we've been doing has been focused on every aspect of our operations and healthcare system. I'll start by talking about our equipment and supplies. We've been working to make sure that we can maintain and procure appropriate supply levels across our organization, and we're doing this through both our traditional supply chain methods as well as looking at non-traditional areas to make sure that we have enough supplies here to be able to safely care for our patients. We're also working across with our team members to ensure that the utilization of these supplies is being done consistently with national guidelines to ensure that we use what we have in the most appropriate manner. We've also been looking at our equipment needs, um, in particular uh, ventilators, to ensure that we will have enough ventilators should the need require us to go beyond what we typically have. We typically operate 72 ventilators here at the medical center um, and through our ability to bring in temporary units and to repurpose other equipment that we have in the organization, such as anesthesia machines, we would be able to operate up to 172 ventilators should the situation require that. We are also looking at our facility capacity and making sure that both in our emergency department as well as in our inpatient units that we've identified all areas where we can uh, safely care for our patients so that we can accommodate uh, increased numbers of patient volumes that may be headed our way as this situation continues to unfold. We are also looking, uh, as testing becomes more available, of looking beyond uh, the four walls of the medical center and establishing uh, respiratory clinics as well as drive-through testing. And more information will be forthcoming as we have more testing availability in the area about uh, how that would work and how we can make that accessible to those that require it. And then lastly, we are also looking um, in our outpatient setting at the use of both phone appointments and telehealth so that we can continue to care for patients in the most appropriate way and most appropriate location based on their clinical conditions. So again, um, I would just like to reassure everyone that even though we find ourselves in unusual times, Lakeland Regional Health and our incredibly talented team stands ready to be able to care for you. I would like to thank all of our medical staff, our nurses, our allied health professionals, and our corporate departments that are working round the clock to make sure that we're here for you both in the short term and as we continue to see how this situation unfolds. Thank you. So equally, as you've heard all of our um, medical leadership and Danielle say, our first thanks goes out to the community. We know by working together, we will do what this community needs to have safe health care um, through the COVID-19 crisis. We also want to thank the media. Um, you know, the coverage of getting information out, calming people, being transparent, and we want to partner with you on that, and we will assure the media outlets that as situations change here, as there's key important updates, we will get back to you and we will share them. I would be remiss in not thanking our board of directors, in addition to all of our medical staff and our team members for the incredible work that they do. Also, our mayor, our city commissioners, the city management for the partnership of that effort, and really the partnership between the Department of Health, the CDC, and us at this time gives us a lot of strength, not just locally, but as you look at some of the best clinicians in the world guiding us through this journey. Um, I also just want to have one more shout out to this community. Please take this virus seriously, though. All of the tips that our team just shared with you, number one, watch and practice great infection prevention. Please monitor your own health. If you have respiratory signs, please stay home. Monitor them carefully. If you decide that you need care, please call your provider, whether it's one of our physicians or whether it's a community physician, please give them a call with a heads up that you want an appointment or you're coming in. 
and please call any Urgy Center and emergency department in addition and give them a heads up that you desire care, that you believe you may have COVID-19. So again, we can assure that our team members and you are absolutely as safe as possible. And as Dr. Haight said, we know this is really hard to have such a request out there for social distancing. But as you can see, if we can slow down the rate at which this virus affects this community, your physicians and the healthcare system will do a much better job in making sure each and every one gets great care and is truly safe. And with that, I would just like to um, conclude the press conference and then open it up for questions. Sure, sure. The, uh, the patient was transported by uh, Polk County EMS, and uh, the positions that are currently part of the investigation for the Department of Health have to do with the, uh, I believe, the registration team and a couple of uh, nurses. This does not mean that they were exposed or infected, but just out of an abundance of caution, we want to make sure that they're safe, that our patients are safe, and that the community is safe. Currently, that is the recommendation is two weeks. Would it make any sense for everyone to wear a face shield so that whoever comes in, you're protected? Or as protected as we can be? I don't know if I could take that one on for you. Right now, we're following CDC and the Department of Health guidelines. Realize protective patient equipment across the country needs to be appropriately used. And so we're following that guideline right now. There is not enough PPE in the country to have every person who possibly could be with anybody being in that garb full time. So the CDC has absolutely given us guidelines with the Department of Health and we're following them at this time. What are we we absolutely feel comfortable that our team now has the protective patient equipment, including masks, that they need to take care of their patients now. We are not using bandana and scarves, and we are working very aggressively, as Danielle spoke, about having procurement activities go on that will keep that status in that direction at this time. Thank you for the question. Right now, the Department of Health is conducting their investigation, and really all we can disclose at this time is the patient's age and gender. Okay, and then second, what steps are you taking to, A, keep your staff safe when you're dealing with a COVID-19 positive patient, and B, keep the other patients who are in the hospital and you're doing for you know, other care safe as well as your Dr. Regan, why don't you take that? Because you spoke a little bit about how our triage pro you know, policies have changed, but you're definitely closer to that. Sure. So, you know, we are abiding by the guidelines from the CDC, the Department of Health, you know, through consultation with our infectious disease specialist. We are having daily meetings between emergency department, internal medicine, infectious disease, pulmonology, critical care, to make sure that we are consistent with the care that we're providing and with the screening protocols. The patients, the staff in the emergency department are following our guidelines. Uh, we have the equipment that we need. We, they understand we are doing continuous training. Every time new team members come on for shifts, we are readdressing, again, what sort of protection they have to take. on from a system perspective and, and there's no you know news to you all because you're the news um, that we would love to have more testing capability I would say right now the number one thing that we are looking towards having is testing capabilities as Danielle pointed out if we had access to more tests we would be starting to open up an ambulatory and a drive-through testing facility so I think that's out there we would love more um, protective um, personal protective equipment 
to be available. We believe we have enough and we're utilizing it wisely. But it, it would be comforting to know that there was national stockpiles of that that were adequate. So I think they're probably the two largest areas of um, resources that would help us. Obviously, as Dr. Haight pointed out, all of us would love a vaccine. All of us would love a little bit more history of what medications are showing to be very effective. Um, but I think that will evolve in the future. And again, if we can slow down the rate at which people get that virus, it will allow us to have those answers to be able to take better care. Right, so right now we are, have the ability to obtain specimens. Tests are sent out to either the Department of Health or the other commercial testing centers. You don't have testing. We have the ability to collect specimens, but the test is not being performed here. And there is a difference because I understand it can be confusing to people. So if people come thinking that the test would be done here and they would have a result before they leave here, that is not the case at this point. Typically, it's 24 to 48 hours. And we have the access to have 900 specimens be collected at this period of time. I have one other question. 172 sounds like a lot to me, but is that enough ventilation? Or what Danielle, do you want to address sure. that? Yes, obviously, I think, you know, based on where we are on a normal day, we feel as though that provides ample capacity for us to be able to handle a, a surge of patients that, that may come in and require a ventilator for their care. Yeah, and just, just to give some reassurance on top of that, what I want the community to remember is that currently, statistically, it's less than 3% of patients would require that type of ventil ventilatory support. Um, but, you know, we want to be prepared for this. Um, and, and that is part of the preparation. So our, despite the capabilities, right now we are not running anywhere near those numbers. Um, and it's, it's not even usual for us to be using all 72 of our standard ventilators as part of our, you know, our normal allotment of, of ventilators. We, are, we do not use 100% of them. Yes, we will be working through those planning processes over the next couple of days. Sure, absolutely. So yes, as testing becomes more available, our hope is that we would be able to be able to work up more patients in an ambulatory or outpatient setting. So we would take one of our existing locations and really convert that to be exclusively for working up patients with these respiratory conditions, perform testing, and then be able to, to treat and uh, give them guidance in that setting. Any patient who is positive or has a pending test for COVID, we have standard guidelines for the staff in terms of when they should wear masks and what kind of mask to wear. So there are several different kinds of masks that we wear in the medical center every day. The standard recommendation for, um, for mask when dealing with a COVID positive patient is what's called an N95 mask. And there are several varieties of the N95 masks. So we have, we are trying to make this as simple as possible for our team members in terms of them understanding when to wear what mask. And that is in concert with our hope to make sure that this patient population are treated in one particular area of the hospital so that the rest of our team and the rest of the community understands if it's not in that particular location, it's not it doesn't have to be as high in the priority list of their things to do. So you can see, I mean, just, you know, just to add a little bit to that, like, and maybe we can just connect the dots. We can do the best job for you if you are experiencing respiratory <clears throat> distress to call us before you bring yourself in. Of course, if it's urgent, it's 911, 911, right? Mm -hmm. But if you call ahead, we can really even have you wait in the car until we have someone properly donned to go get you to come in. 
Absolutely, at the first point of our screening, and if you walked in and all around the medical center, there is incredible screening going on right now asking people for their symptomatology. Anyone who reports symptomatology, gets a, they get immediately a mask, and they get triage to staff that know that there's risk that will have donned the appropriate PPE going forward. So every part of this food chain is getting strengthened to do that. Your comment before, I think, was related even a little bit about the exposure level possibly to team members. I just want you to know the Department of Health is partnering with us in a very good investigation. Most of this campus is videotaped. We have the ability to go back and watch the videotape as we are doing to assure that we know if there was anyone who we feel was at risk, we can work with the Department of Health on that investigation. And with that, I. I would respectfully like to end the um, press conference. I just, Dr. Reagan, Dr. Hayton, Danielle, as you can imagine, have their hands full on just making sure we're keeping up with this evolving situation. But thank you again. We really appreciate your coverage of the press conference and your advocacy in working with the community to keep them educated. Thank you.